Hey everybody, welcome back to another live stream from Synapse Care Solutions. This is Kathy Randall and I'm so glad that you're here. This is week three of our Silent Night series for December and we're focusing on neonatal sleep, attachment, and giving back from the NICU. So this week we have Dr. Natalie Hunt. She's a neonatal nurse practitioner from Baltimore and we are excited to have her present some of the science behind neonatal sleep, ways to assess it, and strategies to improve it in the NICU. This was part of her dissertation project and we were really grateful to have her present during the 2021 One Conference that we did online. So if you would like to get some of the resources for this presentation and our entire series, go ahead and either scan the QR code here on the screen or click the link in our show notes below and you'll be able to go over to a page where you enter your email address and you can get access to all the replays, all the resources and reminders that we give about our live streams. So presentation, if you're enjoying these presentations, go ahead and do me a favor. Go over to our YouTube channel and hit that subscribe button and of course hit the like button for this presentation but definitely hit that subscribe button it helps us out a lot it tells YouTube that you like our content and really helps us to be able to bring you more free content so without further presentation it is week three in our December silent night um, series so I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you at the end Hello, good morning, good morning, everybody. Hey, thanks everybody for being here. We're so excited. Can you believe day one's already over, Shannon? I No, I can't believe it. I could, just like I said, the anticipation coming up to this event is so much and so much planning and so much, so much yes. talking to everybody. And then we get there and I'm like, oh, that was amazing. That was flawless. That was so great. And that, the lineup of speakers today, I am just so excited. Me too. Me too. Tell everybody a little bit about the social hour last night and some of the fun things we did. Oh, I love a good social hour. I love the drinking game of drink. If you have ever been to a quadruple delivery, have ever taken home. Oh my gosh. Has anybody ever taken home fentanyl in their pocket and had to come back and waste it? <laughs> stuff like that. Things that you encounter in the, if you wear Crocs, if you have a fanny pack, I should have gone the figs route, right? Everybody's wearing figs now. That's all the rage. If you don't have the fantastic Royal blue uniforms that they have in my hospital, but so just fun stuff like that. I think that's, again, one of the greatest parts of this conference. Again, just big thanks to everybody yesterday. Yeah. Of course, we all want to be together in person. This is, we are one and we're here together. And we ready will overcome to... the obstacles. <laughs> that's overcome. right. That's right. We're a big one community and, and glad that so many new people can join us too. I saw a lot of commenting that people are saying it's their first time. And so just welcome to this day. And we always promise to deliver content. And yes. yesterday was a little heart and head. And I hope that you enjoyed that mix. I'm excited about today. I want to encourage you to keep thinking about what is your one thing? What's mm -hmm. that thing you're going to do when you finish this one conference this year? But start thinking about what's that thing that's going to really excite you to work on for the next year. So I think I have, always have a note, the notebook right beside me of like my little scribble notes of this is great. Okay. Let's mm -hmm. look up this article and look at what this person is doing or this unit, or make sure I talk to this person afterwards to see how they implemented that. I think that is the, the great part of this and how we try to bring it to back to home is to make sure that you find your passion in all of the things that we're talking about. And there's some amazing talks today. I can't wait. Yeah. So with that, let's bring on um, Sarah Bakke. She's going to help moderate this morning's session. Good morning, Sarah. Thanks again for being with us, being part of the planning committee, faculty. It's a multitask of things that you do for us around here. And I'm excited to have you. And Sarah even led the 5K this morning, took a shower, came back, and look how fantastic she looks. So we're, Impressive. we're so glad to have you with us. So. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah, I'll let you take it away. Yeah, welcome everybody. And it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker this morning to you, Natalie. Natalie is not only a faculty for us, but she's also one of our newest planning committee members. So we're very thrilled to have her. Natalie has been a neonatal nurse since graduating from nursing school in 2005. She became a neonatal nurse practitioner in 2012 and has been practicing in the NICU at the University of Maryland Medical Center for the last nine years. During her time there, she's played important roles in developing the NICU Cuddler program, as um, well as uh, the neonatal neonatal neurocritical care program. She's currently pursuing her Doctor of Philosophy in Nursing degree at the University of Maryland School of Nursing, focusing on the impact of care in the NICU on sleep in preterm infants and neurodevelopmental outcomes associated with NICU care. So welcome, Natalie. Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Kathy, for letting me be a part of this awesome conference. So I'm just going to go ahead and get started. Today, I'm going to be talking about understanding and protecting sleep in preterm infants. So my objectives today are to um, help the learner identify three stages of sleep in neonates, describe negative effects of sleep deprivation in preterm infants, and describe some strategies that we can use to protect and promote sleep in the NICU. 
I have no disclosures to. I want to start off by just going over uh, the impact of preterm birth. Nearly 15 million infants are born prematurely globally each year, with the U.S. having the sixth greatest number of preterm births uh, out of countries that report their preterm birth numbers. And in the U.S., the preterm birth rate has rose to 10% in 2019, up from 9.8% in 2016. And this number, over probably the past seven, eight years, has steadily increased after about a decade of decreasing in numbers. So we've been seeing an increase in preterm birth over the past few years. And just to note, there are differences in preterm birth rates among races, with African-American women having a preterm birth rate of about 14% uh, percent being 50% higher than preterm birth rates in Hispanic as well as white women. So we know that uh, preterm babies are at risk for increased medical complications, including neurodevelopmental and cognitive delay, breathing difficulties, including apnea, chronic lung disease, feeding immaturity, vision and hearing impairments, and cerebral palsy. And in 2015, approximately 1 million children died due to complications of prematurity. And again, we know most of these preterm infants will have some long-term health consequences. So sleep in the neonate is uh, necessary for normal growth and development. And it serves to develop the sensory system, preserve brain plasticity, and create long-term memory and cognitive function. Infant sleep is composed of three stages. You have active sleep, quiet sleep, and indeterminate or trans, um, transitional sleep, which can have characteristics of both active and quiet sleep. Uh, compared to adults, active sleep in the preterm infant is comparable to rapid eye movement or REM sleep. Uh, and can be characterized by having high physiologic activity, irregular breathing patterns, You'll see low voltage on EEG, increased heart rate to increase oxygen supply to the brain. And around two to three months of age, you'll see some metonia of the postural um, muscles, which is a little more characteristic with REM in adults. And in quiet sleep, um, which is comparable to non-REM sleep in adults, you'll see more vis visually recognizable um, cues, including the infant making faces, smiling, having some sucking movements, some blinking and trembling, and having a more regular heart and respiratory rate with little variability. Sleep weight cycling starts to begin to develop around 28 to 30 weeks gestation and can be detectable on EEG by about 30 weeks gestation. Your quiet sleep um, is necessary more so for the brain restoration with your active sleep being more necessary for the normal neural sensory development. So we know disruption in that um, normal cycling of sleep stages has the potential to have negative neurological outcomes, especially during these periods of critical brain development. On this slide, I just wanted to show you these are just some AEG patterns of infants, as you can see on this right side. I'm not sure if you can see my mouse, but on the right side, you have the weeks. You have 30, 32, just as the infant gets older. And you see here in 30 weeks on that first top strip, there's more just a discontinuous pattern. But then as the infant gets older, you start to see this widening and narrowing sleep cycling develop as the infant gets older, showing them going through those quiet and active sleep times. So newborn sleep for about 70% of the 24-hour period, so about 16 to 18 hours in a day, with preterm infants born 27 to 34 weeks gestation, sleeping about 40 to 45 minutes on average, with infants born 35 to 41 weeks, sleeping about 50 to 70 minutes on average. Active sleep is the predominant sleep state in preterm infants, being about 90% of their sleep being in active sleep when they're born around 30 weeks gestation. And then by term, you'll see that amount of active sleep decrease to about 50%. So what happens when babies don't get enough sleep? So we know that babies in the NICU are at higher risk for sleep disruption due to the need for therapeutic care and medical interventions. But sleep disruption can have a negative impact on normal growth and development of the preterm infant by disrupting brain growth, hormone production, and just overall healing of the baby. And sleep deprivation can cause behavioral changes, causing an increase in ex energy expenditure. And some of those behavioral changes you'll see, babies will be more fatigued, have more restlessness, and be irritable. And using all that energy obviously will negatively impact their weight gain and attentiveness. So there's also a few articles, researchers that have looked at animal models, looking at sleep depri deprivation in preterm infants. And what they saw was that these infants as adults have um, increased anxiety, reduced sexual activity, as well as sleep disturbances. Also, when babies don't get enough sleep, these infants between 30 weeks to about four to five months post-term that experience sleep deprivation during active sleep have um, been, no been noted to have disordered or delayed development of neurosensory systems, such as issues with touch and motion, their auditory visual um, systems, as well as their memory systems. So we know it's imperative for NICUs to provide that individualized, developmentally appropriate care 
that serves to preserve and promote healthy undisturbed sleep in preterm infants so that we can allow for that normal development as preterm infants who don't establish that mature sleep wake cycle have been shown to have worse neurodevelopmental outcomes compared to those that do. I just wanted to go over a few studies that have looked at sleep disruption in the NICU and how often and how much we're interfering with baby sleep. So one study, Pereira, in 2013, did an exploratory observational study and looked at just 20 preterm infants, looking at the frequency, duration, and type of manipulations that babies were getting in their NICU and found over a 24-hour period, infants were subjected to 14 to 71 manipulations and 34 to over 100 procedures in a 24-hour period with about 92% of those manipulations being less than or equal to 10 minutes. Maki's group in 2017 did a, also a descriptive correlational study looking at handling procedures to in, assess the influence of total sleep and wake times. And they found that in a 24-hour period, infants were subjected to a mean of 176 handlings, with 73% of those handlings being directly hands-on with the other percentage just being in the bed, in the baby's environment. The mean total amount of sleep time that they found with these babies was about 57% in a 24 hour period. So a good amount less than the 70% that we usually see. Again, some of the limitations with these studies, they were small samples. Levy's group in 2017, they did a secondary analysis on term and near term infants with that were at risk for cerebral dysfunction. And they found that 12 out of 25 of the infants in their study were able to complete a full 60-minute sleep-wake cycle between clinical care episodes, and that when given these hands-on care, it usually resulted in arousal or awakenings in about 57% uh, of all the contact episodes. And these episodes are usually followed by a sort, some sort of respiratory event, be it an apnea or DSAT event. Orsi's group in 2017 did an observational correlation study with 12 preterm infants, about 32-ish weeks. And they also looked in a 24-hour period and found that the infants were handled, again, at a high rate, a mean of 147 times, and found statistical significance in the total amount of handling and time of handling in the daytime versus the nighttime. Brandon and her group did also a secondary analysis looking at the relationship between nursing care and sleep-wake patterns and 71 preterm infants around 28 weeks. And they did some observations, mostly between 7 p.m. and 11 p.m., so overnight. And they found that infants that had interactive nursing care, which is more talking to the baby during care versus just hands-on in and out, were able to remain asleep in an active sleep. And then when infants were left alone, they were able to remain asleep long enough to reach quiet sleep. Law and his group in 2012 did a prospective descriptive repeated studies measures looking at caregiving and infant positioning effects on sleep wake states and state changes in preterm infants. And again, found that the absence of caregiving increased social interaction, babies being positioned in the lateral position and also providing non-nutritive sucking increased the occurrence of infants being sleep long enough to attain quiet sleep. So these multiple studies just highlight, I think we all know that cluster care is best, but these studies highlight that even knowing that we still are struggling with leaving babies alone and letting them be able to have that time to sleep. So just to go through a few things that we can do to promote and protect sleep while we're babies are in the NICU. One big thing is looking at the environment, environmental factors that can promote and protect sleep. Noise levels in the NICU are uh, a big factor. We know that most of the noise that babies incur are from human activity, from the alarms, from the equipment. Uh, so, you know, when providing care, you know that you can, these are things that you can try to eliminate try to have quick responses to your IV pump or your feeding pump alarming, have quick responses to your monitor alarming. Try to keep noise levels in the NICU. If you have sound machines, recommend it to be less than 45 decibels. Light levels, artificial brightness from things such as exam lights or phototherapy can have negative effects when your belly mask isn't on properly. All of those things can have um, negative effects on sleep in the NICU. Continuous intense lighting can negatively affect the development of baby circadian rhythm. Luckily in our NICU, we're able to have some rooms that have windows so that we can provide that natural light versus the artificial light. So the use of cycle lighting versus just having your bed light lights on for long periods of time is something that we can utilize in the NICU.
just looking at the care that we do, how we handle babies. Again, we know that we try to do cluster care. Sometimes the baby's condition doesn't um, allow for only cluster care, but to attempt to do as much care during those routine care times is um, very important. We know that babies experience excessive manipulation by the healthcare team. You have the nurses doing their cares and then and the neo coming in to do their care. You have the practitioner coming in to do their exam randomly. And then here comes the fellow and then here comes x-ray and oh, we forgot the lab draw. So there's multiple things that um, we look at that we could you know, try to be more active in um, including all those things to cluster them together around baby's care times. The way we position babies, we try for midline. We know that prone position is most beneficial than requiring later teaching for parents for safe sleep at home, obviously. Using positioners and safe boundaries, you want to be able to create that nesting that helps minimize infant sudden movements, helps keep the infant in a better position to improve comfort and sleep for these babies. Swaddling with the use of a blanket if they're able to tolerate that or at the age that um, they can be swaddled. And then just the different devices that we have in the NICU, like in this picture, that we're able to use to help with nesting and facilitated tucking as well. And then just some other strategies that we can use in the NICU, doing skin-to-skin -skin holding and kangaroo care with parents, teaching parents to do containment with hands, non-nutritive sucking, other interventions that have been seen to be beneficial in promoting sleep, just gentle touch, massage therapy with babies, referring to your physical therapy team as well, just to work on just some other, all these strategies that have been found to be beneficial to help promote baby sleep while they're in the NICU. Just at the end here, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the research study that I'm doing for my dissertation for my PhD. It's called the NICU Impact on Preemie Sleep. It's a feasibility study. And the purpose of the study is to explore sleep-wake patterns in preterm infants in the NICU and examine how care in the NICU impacts sleep-wake patterns of preterm infants, as well as examine potential effects disruptions in sleep-wake patterns have on neural behavioral assessment scores. And the methods to do this study, I plan to use actigraphy, which researchers use to look at sleep-wake patterns. But we'll use actigraphy, which is similar to a small Fitbit. It monitors activity and movement to assess sleep-wake patterns in infants. So we'll use actigraphy in that first week of life just to look at early sleep disruption. And then at the same time during this week, the nurses have an infant care journal where they'll document any care that's outside of routine care. If the baby has an x-ray or gets a lab draw, a provider assessment, family interaction as well, just to get a sense of what care is being um, provided to these patients outside of their routine care times and how those different care activities might affect babies' sleep-wake patterns. And then when the infants are about one month of life, I go back and do a neurobehavioral assessment using the end. And then I plan to take that information of a neurobehavioral assessment and tie it back to the amount of time they're sleeping, the amount of time that they are awake, how long their sleep periods are, and see if there's any correlation between um, those sleep variables and how it may have impacted the, their neural behavior scores later on at a month of age. So three of my aims that I have for this study to first describe sleep-wake patterns of preterm infants in a level four NICU. Secondly, to describe NICU, certain NICU care activities that disrupt infant sleep and examine associations between those NICU care activities and the number and length of wake times that the babies have. And then thirdly, to explore associations between actigraphic sleep-wake patterns and neural behavior assessments. So in my program, they always ask, why is this important? What is your so what? Why should we even care that you want to do this study? And today, my response is, just review all the previous slides. I hope during this presentation that I've given you more than enough information to make the argument that protecting sleep in preterm babies in the NICU is an extremely important thing that we should all keep in mind and be active in, in protecting that. So uh, I am currently recruiting. I'm hoping to have all of my data and everything finished, my dissertation finished and have graduated by the next one conference. Hopefully by next year, I will be able to present the findings from my study and any other studies that may have left from that study. Just in case anyone's looking at their computer like this lovely lady and thinking of any questions, you can feel free to ask, but I just ask for the easy questions. That was great, Natalie. Definitely look forward to having you back and hearing about your project. I had a question. So tell me more about the, these like sleep fitbits for, is it 
do you put it on the baby or what does that look like? They are, like I said, they're just like little, small, little Fitbits. I use, they're obviously smaller than this, yeah. um, probably like half the size. And I just take the part that just measures the sleep and tape it to a soft band that you can find okay. it in the And so you just wrap that around um, either of the lower extremities and just keep that on for, we're doing at least three and a half days just to get a good 72 hours. And yeah, so I, when I explain it to parents, I just say, it's like the mini Fitbit. Um, yeah, it doesn't that. have any kind of Bluetooth capability. There's no, okay. you know, anything like that. It literally is just a, a device that measures movement. It's been used in a few studies. It's grown a little bit of popularity, especially in preterm infants in the NICU. Yeah just because it's much easier to use. It's much less non-invasive than like the full um, on sonography that is um, right. kind of old standard, but that's very hard to use in the NICU. But yeah, these little devices are able yeah, to- Yeah, what a great option yeah. for people to be able to do smaller scale research projects and, yeah. don't, and don't have the, the capability to do those full montage. I think that's really Absolutely. cool. Absolutely, yeah. We have some questions. Um, so our first question is, your slide um, said that preterm infants born 27 to 34 weeks sleep about 40 to 45 minutes on average. And um, we're wondering if that's per hour or total. So in a sleep period, so mm -hmm. from falling to falling asleep and then to waking back up for the preterm, it's usually about 40 to 45 minutes. They'll fall asleep and then come back up, wake up. And then when they go back into their next sleep um, period, it usually lasts about 40 to 45 minutes. Okay. Okay. And then KD Martin also is wondering, do you use cycled lighting in your unit? And if so, can you share your practice guidelines for the, those of us who do not have units with it? So in, in my unit, we have the capability of cycled lighting. We're working on putting together an actual protocol and guideline to be more consistent with that, that use. Okay. And so with your study, are you just looking to get a baseline of their sleep or are you actually going to be doing interventions? So this is just get like a descriptive baseline okay. on what the sleep okay. looks like in a level four NICU. How long are okay. these babies sleeping in a 24 hour period? How many times are, how many wake bouts do they have and how long are yeah. their wake bouts? So this is more okay. of a descriptive kind of feasibility study, even to see, cause this, most of the studies that have used actigraphy um, have had mm -hmm. small sample sizes um, yeah. and have been in bigger, older babies. So this study is to see what is the feasibility of using this as a tool to examine sleep in uh, preterm babies in a level four NICU. Okay, great. Another question from Ann Shields. I often wonder if our 22nd Brady to the 80s without apnea is just deep sleep, but then we go slap them awake for it. <laughs> yeah, there has been some some studies that have shown like when babies are go and have apnea, sometimes it is just them in that, getting into that deep sleep and then they, they just have the apnea, but yeah. you, know, you have to, sometimes if they don't come out themselves, you gotta give them a yeah. pat. So. Yeah, but yeah, it definitely probably is them getting into that deep sleep. Yeah, I, I once had a neonatologist ask me, I think that my baby had a Brady to like the 30s. And he said, Oh, did you give them a chance to self recover? I'm like, No, I did not. <laughs> Another question from Katie Martin. What do you find is a good approach to families that come in and try to wake the baby because they can only visit at a time at that time and want to see their baby awake? This is a, that's a great question because I know that happens a lot. Yeah. And that's a hard one. Yeah, it's funny. I was just talking to my sister who had preemie twins and we were just talking about my presentation and she was saying how when she went to visit her babies, they were just like hands off. You can't yeah. they to sleep. You can't touch them. And I think that's a hard one because you have some parents mm -hmm. that are just like, okay, you do whatever is best for the baby. But then you do have some parents that are like, this is the only hour that I can come and see my yeah. baby. So it is, there is that struggle, but I think in an overall picture, you have to kind of balance uh, promoting that family maternal infant mm -hmm. bond. Cause we also know that's extremely beneficial for baby as well. With on the other hand, do you not want to wake this baby up? So I think that's a hard one, but I think yeah. um, the maternal infant bonding might yeah. trump the not wake the baby up a little and bit. Sharon made a comment and I was thinking the same thing. Could you maybe offer them skin to skin? Exactly. That's the trade off. Yeah. Exactly. Yep. And then we have another question. Uh, so you're, the study you're looking at doing in your center, and then do you have sister hospitals that you would expand to potentially? Yeah, so we actually just, one of our sister hospitals just built a new hospital that now their NICU is going from an open bay to a single 
bed unit. So I'm hoping that as a continuation of this study, I'll be able to pull in from that site as well. I wanted to tease out the different type of NICUs just to decrease it because obviously that's going to be a, a, a big factor if you have a single family room versus an open bay. The exposure of noise and light and all those things will be completely different. So I want to tease that out. So I'm hoping that as a continuation of my study, I'll be able to tag on with this, our sister hospital, just to increase sample size as well. And now you're starting with preemies, and then will you expand to um, term and sick term infants as well? So right now I'm looking at preemies just because my focus is what is the effect of the of sleep disruption in that early gestation. We know that in that 28 to 30 week gestation, that's when the sleep and is cycling starting to develop. So I want to specifically see if we mess up something in that time frame. what does that do to neurodevelopmental outcomes later? So that is the, the focus right now. But I think with actigraphy, since it's such an easy device to use, I definitely want to look at what other, where else can we use that that would be beneficial in yeah. all the babies in the NICU. It seems like a very scalable project, which is mm -hmm. great. We have a question from Jill. Do you do Q4 or Q6 hour handling times? Or I guess, does it differ depending on the baby? In our unit, if babies are feeding, they do Q3. And if they're not, they get Q4 handlings. If we have a very sick, tenuous baby, they will get eyes on Q3, but hands on Q6. So it's, um, we try to make it as individualized as we can. Do we have any other questions? Amazing work, Natalie. Shannon said she, you, she thinks that your work um, emphasized the importance of nursing research and how impactful it can be to work at the bedside, definitely. Thank you. Thanks, Natalie. I just had a couple more questions. <laughs> so talk to people a little bit about what this process was like. You're an NP working in the unit, you have this research project. So what were the steps and what have been some of the challenges in just really doing this full project? I can say that I went into my PhD with a focus on NAS babies and, and that's where the cuddler program developed. Our plan mm -hmm. was to develop the cuddler program and then look at the effects of having a prescribed cuddler regimen for our NAS babies. And then COVID happened. <laughs> and then we had to look at other things. So I just did a step back and what is happening in my unit? What is happening in the NICU? And started to look at what are we doing to, why are we waking babies up? What is that doing to our preemies? My overall focus is always neurodevelopmental outcomes in, in all of our NICU babies. But I had a mentor that specifically looked at actigraphy in pediatrics. And we talked about actigraphy and I'm like, that would be cool to use in the NICU. More people should do this. So that's where that path came from. And like I said, I did my comp exam and then COVID happened. And then so that kind of stopped the process for a year. And then luckily I was able to start back up and convince the IRB that this is something that could be done safely with for myself, for the staff, for the babies. And luckily I was able to get IRB approval this past February and start recruiting. It's just a feasibility study. We're only looking to enroll about 12 babies. And so we are a third of the way there. So you use this big word I haven't heard before. Activity <laughs> something? Um, actigraphy. Actigraphy? Is that what you called it? Yep, actigraphy. Most of the studies have been in like pediatric and, and adult patients. Some of the studies that I referenced in my presentation did use actigraphy and different devices, obviously. And you, obviously it comes as like a watch. And so the first couple of babies, we had the watch on and it just twirled around or just baby just kicked it off. So we had to figure out a way to NICUize it. <laughs> Hence the uh, soft band and just pop off the, the straps. And the important part is just the little device part. But it's, you know, it's super cool. If we have time, I can just show you what an Actigraph looks like. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. But it, and it's, it's cool because it also um, picks up light exposure. So you'll get, let's see, you'll get not only just movement of the baby, but you'll also get how much light exposure that they're getting. So that's another piece that's in the, the back of our heads to look at light exposure in our babies as well. So um, this is an actogram. This is uh, one that I, just to test out the actograph. So this is on an adult, either myself or I made my husband wear one, my, <laughs> just in my kids. So you can see all the yellow is light exposure. So you can see this is all during the day, all this yellow stuff, this is light. And then here, the, all the black stuff is our activity count. Say in about one minute, it'll measure how much activity and the device has an algorithm that it calculates all this jazz. So it measures every minute how much activity you have there. 
And so then you see here, obviously, it's one o'clock in the morning, why not? We're just going to sleep. <laughs> and so this dark um, blue is when we're sleeping, we have little activity, the lights are off, there's no yellow. And then there's like a little part here with some light shade. So you're resting, so you're probably still in bed, but you just haven't gotten up yet. So you're resting in bed and then your day goes on and you're up and about counting activity, looking at light. And then again, you go back to sleep. This is kind. This is what we're looking at for our babies to look at where are their activities, when are the activity goes down, that's letting us know that the baby is probably asleep. And then we'll count that over a three day, three day period. So I just, I think as a blanket statement, I think we underestimate the number of disturbances as that we do at the bedside is actual disturbances. I think Absolutely. we think that a disturbance is a big handling when really it's, I'm going to open the, the door, put something back in and grab something mm -hmm. back out or the thing my, that my suction is super loud, whatever it may be. I'm checking my bag. It's beginning of my shift. I think we vastly underestimate the actual disturbances that we do as a bedside provider. So I was just thinking, yes, the log is a great idea, of course, because that's easy. Do you guys have NICU cameras so you could correlate the actual what is going on in that? We in thought that? about that, but just looking at some other studies, it would, it would it's very labor intensive. It's very literally looking at second by second yes. and needing to have at least two people do it just to make sure there's congruency. So Actually. we didn't do that. I, yeah. I get it, but I'm just like it's thinking of it. I'm like, oh, because we say, oh, I haven't gone into that isolate at all. I'm like, you're serious because I've right. yeah. been sitting here for 45 minutes watching you touch everything sideways, this way, all the all over the place. And if you think that's not disturbing anybody's sleep, especially this <laughs> tiny human who really can't regulate them very well, I just yeah. So yeah, logs are so much easier. But yes, we have one um, other question about funding. How did you fund the? Actograph. Like I said, my mentor already used Actograph, so I was okay. able to use her. And then I got some, one of my mentors got some funding from my school to purchase a couple extra ones. Great. That's really awesome. Yeah. I think the sleep research is so important. It's something that I think with developmental care and trying to figure out the impact of our care on later life is just, so sleep deprivation is a torture technique. Like really, mm -hmm. exactly. it is absolutely something they use in torture yeah. and being in a hospital, being inpatient is sleep deprivation. Nobody needs to come and empty a garbage can at three in the morning. But I, I think this is so important to see these little impacts and how many touches we have every moment, how often they're disturbed. Someone was talking about alarm volumes. Has Have we gone to, can we get it to our vault instead of it being loud? And if we have pod rooms or anything like that, you have all these alarms going off. So I, I just think yeah. this is amazing, Natalie. I'm so, it's so very impressed. Just like excited. looking at one of one of my patients, just looking at the data, just like a quick through. It was interesting. The nurse noted there was one baby. It was the baby had hands-on care. And then 20 minutes later, a provider came and did an assessment. Another 20 minutes later, another provider came in and did an assessment. And I think literally 15 minutes later, the baby got an x-ray. So when did this baby get to sleep? In and out. In the More questions here. Um, do any of the studies differentiate between percentage of sleep disruption by parents versus staff? They they don't, and that's what I'm, I'm hoping to do that in in my study. That's why we specifically want to do a care journal where the nurses would specifically label what care or what interruption was happening during that wake period. Okay. And then we have a question: What lit level do you use? Twenty five or less, or twenty five to fifty? I'm not sure what that I'm is. not sure. So we don't specifically have any that I know of devices that monitor light levels in our unit. So I'm not sure. Okay. And Sharon says it would be really interesting if you were able to monitor noise level as well during your study. And you had mentioned looking it at would be, It would be. We're just adding things to your study now. Yeah, no, you know, now that you presented it, now that you have the approval, I, I be, we well, just would I, like to just pile on a couple more things. I, one of my mentors, because we had just, we've had AEG in our unit, but we with developing our neuro NICU um, program in the past couple of years, we've started to like really get them into use. And they're like, oh, you should add EAG to your study. And I'm like, I know that would be awesome, but I already did my proposal defense. No, <laughs> I'm not going yeah. back. Game over. Yeah. This is the study. So, no, These are fantastic well, ideas for yeah, later. It's great, but for later. But no, we do actually in each of our rooms have a sound detector. Mm -hmm. We haven't started using them yet. So okay. we're waiting for our good friends from Biomed to sign off on them. But we definitely plan to also beef up our sound, monitoring our noise levels and maybe in the later part of my research, I can include that as well. I'm, just, I'm telling you, we're just giving you follow-up studies to do, right? I know, I your PhD you have to publish. <laughs> we are just going to supply you with things to do. Yeah, that's great. Someone else is wondering about when you put the phototherapy banks to the isolettes, that, that if there's like a vibration that happens that increases the noise. I that know. I don't know. I don't think the actograph probably wouldn't pick up on, up that. on that. It wouldn't, yeah. It's literally like a Fitbit, like you have to be moving. Yeah, it. yeah. 
Okay. Well, I think that makes it so easy though, too, to convince bedside providers to, to use this and to be a part of this study. It's like an easy thing that they don't, they have to put on. It's not, and needles for AEG or even like hydrogels, like that's a little bit more labor intense. And mm -hmm. I feel like I would get a little pushback from my nurses on that one. And, and then we were talking about like tiny baby units. I'm like, we can just put AEG on guys. And then when they are asleep, you can't touch them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but if it's just a little Fitbit band, they'd be a little bit more receptive, I feel like, too. Yeah. Because it's nothing that's going to really. It's just like you put the ID band on one side yeah. and then you put the soft band on the that's, other. That's and so cool. I think there's that's so awesome. many applications for that. So cool. Mm -hmm. So cool. Yeah, I can't really wait cool. to I can't wait to see the results. <laughs> we have a question about the care journals. Can you describe what that looks like? Is it do they write in it or is there like a checklist? It's, I try to make it as easy as possible. I don't want to stress out my nurses because they've got more important things to do. So it's literally just like a checkbox. What you know, is the time that whatever happened? Check, was the baby awake or asleep? And check, was it lab, x-ray, family, and so forth and so on. And at the end of it, was the baby awake or asleep? And what time did it end? So that way we can take that back to the actigraph data and get good, good correlations to make sure we're timing up things appropriately and seeing on the actigraph what happened based on the care journal so that we can correlate that as best we can. Oh, How many um, kids are you enrolling? 12. So great. When, uh, Ann Shields has a great idea for you. She says that when she was in um, nursing school, she got credit for observing nurses for a study. So apparently like you could get nursing students to watch the videos for you, the video feed for you, no cost. <laughs> Anything no cost, I'm, I support. Yeah, that's a great idea. No, that is, yeah. Free labor. Um, and then we have a comment. Uh, thank you for this information. As a speech therapist, I often have to feel questions about why an infant is not eating well at the magical gestational age when they should be doing so. And I've been challenging the team to think about sleep deprivation as a factor in eating, digestion, and growth. So yeah. can we look at sleep before we jump into high calories, et cetera? Yeah, that's a great. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. that's a big thing. And I, I think just people just don't, it just doesn't, it's not in the forefront of people's head is why isn't this baby eating? Why isn't this baby mm -hmm. growing? And it's, what does the baby need? Are we messing with the baby? Does the baby need to be a little warmer? So he's not burning off calories for no good reason. There's so many of those little things that it's just, he needs more calories, obviously. <laughs> he needs the thicket. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay. I don't think we have any. I think other... we've got everybody's questions. Yeah. yeah, some great questions. This was great. Thanks again, guys, Thank for this you. opportunity. It's my first presentation. So, yeah, you did great. Thank you. We're and, amazing. Um, and I Perfect. can't wait to present next year and have all my study results to share. I think that's yeah, going to be fantastic. I love a good follow up. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank you, Natalie. Thanks. Thank you. All right, wasn't that another great presentation from our 2021 ONE conference? It was such a jam-packed conversation. And so this was one of our general sessions and Natalie did an amazing job presenting the science and just practical tips. And of course, inspiring you, if you're interested in a topic like this, how you can, as a nurse, make a difference. Making You can be a part of research and quality improvement in your NICU too. So all you need to do is have a passion and a plan and you can implement projects like Natalie did. I hope you've been enjoying our silent night in the NICU series about sleep, attachment, and giving. So go ahead and if you haven't already, click the link in the show notes below or scan the QR code somewhere here on this screen so that you can actually get access to our resources, to reminders, and to the replays. We put them all on one page to make it super easy for you. If you like content like this, it helps us a lot. Go ahead and click that like and subscribe button on content can help us to bring you more free content. I hope that you've been enjoying this series. Next week, we have Philip Platt, a nurse practitioner from, um, from Texas. He's going to be sharing with you a missions project that he's been involved with for, by going and teaching NICU nurses in Ethiopia. If this is something that's been on your bucket list, you are not going to want to miss next week's presentation, which is the final week in our silent night in the NICU series. And just to wrap up again, thank you for being here. Thank you for being one of our amazing subscribers and participants in our live streams. And I hope that you have a very happy holiday. Um, this is Kathy and I will see